Hi, so welcome to the second day of Lambda Jam, also known as the last day of Lambda Jam. And today we're going to start off with our third keynote, uh, done by my friend and colleague, Robbie Findler, who's at Northwestern University. He's going to be talking about Racket. In case you don't know, there's this nest of crazy people who work on Scheme and Racket and stuff like that, and they're all very interesting people. So let's welcome Robbie. Thanks. Thank you. OK, so this is maybe a little bit of a strange title. So I wanted to try to give you a sense of what I mean by that title by just doing a little programming. So uh, this is Dr. Racket. And um, Racket programs always begin with a declaration saying what programming language that they're in. And so I'll start with a different one. So this is a programming language we built for writing texts. So you say, like, uh, Fibonacci numbers. Say we want to write a little essay about Fibonacci numbers. They're beautiful. They have math. Blah, blah, blah. Spirals, nature, awesome. OK, the first few are one, uh, 0, 1, let's see. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, uh, 23, I don't know, et cetera. OK, something like that. All right, so this is a programming language, OK? I want to emphasize that this is a programming language despite my um, ability to spell the word beautiful. Um, it, um, and this here, the syntax is inspired by LaTeX. And uh, so we use a at sign instead of a backslash. But like this title here, this is a function, OK? Oh, and we can run it. So if we run it, uh, um, if we run it, we'll see this output rendered, uh, beautiful Fibonacci number output. We can render it as a PDF file. And it uses LaTeX in the back end to do that. Um, and th this, this here, is, this is a function. It's imported, comes directly from the, from the programming language. And like, you know, there's other ones we can, like, we like math here, and I don't know, we like, we like nature. And if we, if we do that, then, um, uh, you know, then w these functions are called, and our text turns the way we expect it to take, right? Um, okay. So uh, since this is a programming language, and as a few of you noticed, like, as I was typing, I think, that I sort of can't do math here, uh, you know, <laughs> We shouldn't, it's a programming language, so why don't we use it to program, right? The Fibonacci numbers are like the world's worst example of recursive function, so let's, let's totally write that, okay? Um, and let's use a different programming language. So this is a programming language for text, so let's use a programming language for like fun little functions. So here's how you write the Fibonacci, uh, let's see, if n is zero, then it's zero, if n is one, then it's one. And otherwise, we take the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. Uh, sorry, two. So this is, let's see. So we can do things like this, and I don't have to do the arithmetic here. And now we want to use this function back in the other file. Um, and in, that's, that's text. And so what we do to be able to get text out of this is we have to make a string. So we can, um, you know, build that over on this side. So if we make a function that takes in a number and we want to turn all the Fibonacci numbers up to that number, we can say build list. Uh, I think it's n fib. Let's see. So if I say fibs of 10, yeah. So that's the first 10 Fibonacci numbers. And then um, turn them into strings. And uh, let's see, add some commas. between them, let's see how we're doing here, yeah, okay. And then uh, make it into one string, okay. So we can put all this stuff together and then we can export it. And this is, here, let me save this. This is um, the same way that functions like title and bold and italic work, except for, you know, this computes something different. And we can provide it and then over here we can require it. Um, 
and then we can say fibs of 10 here. And um, the curly braces here for the argument of title mean that the argument is text. So curly braces are the way that you, know, that you delimit text in the scribble programming language. And um, here I've, uh, I've got square brackets, and that means that the arguments inside are like the number 10 in this case, whatever they are. And so if I, if I run this one, then OK. Now the, I don't know if you can see that. Now the, the math is a little better. Right, and we can, we can do a few more if we wanted to be. That would be cool. Maybe just a couple more. OK, so um, if you're a PL wonk, you're looking at this code, and you're kind of dissatisfied by it a little bit, um, because this is an eminently typable function, right? So um, uh, you know, it's kind of like maybe you want a little more checking. You want to improve the quality of your software, so you're like, OK, this is a library lots of people are going to want to use. So I want to use, <laughs> I want to use types for it. So you can say, OK, I want this to be in typed racket, not in just regular racket. And the type checker, the type checker gets angry because um, we didn't put declarations and the default things it assumes are not correct here. So if we say this is an integer to integer function, and uh, then, OK, then good things are happening. Like, we, we get types here on some of these things. And um, I give a type declaration on this one. This one's integer to string. And uh, that, little, that, little, that little green dot that you probably can't see in the bottom right corner means that the type checker was happy with this. And so now when I run the program, it's, it says it's in typed racket, not regular racket. And when I run something like this, uh, it tells me the type of it before it starts the evaluation. So there'd been a runtime error. I still have seen that, that purple line there saying that that was a string. OK, so I can, um, you know, I can go back over here. And this still works. OK, here, why don't I do something like, let's just see the first two of them. So you believe that it really runs now. OK. Um, and, uh, but one thing that's, that's kind of interesting about this is that Scribble, like LaTeX, is an untyped programming language. And so we're calling from an untyped programming language into a typed programming language, which is dangerous, right? <laughs> so like, I don't know. That's the way you spell true in Racket. So if I run that, ooh. So the, the type system knows, let's go back to the other file, Type system knows that this is a function from integers to integers. What it doesn't know is where this function is going to be used. And so it knows that this integer is good and that it's, the type checker has proven that this function always returns an integer. It has not, however, proven that this function is always called with an integer because, like, it, right there, <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't get called with an integer. And so what it does is it puts a contract on to make sure that the um, you know, that the input really is an integer, and this is the error message you get when it's not. Um, so that's, that's one piece of, of racket. There's a lot of stuff, like, that goes into having, being a programming language, programming language. Um, so let's put this back. Anybody know what happened if I, if I put another zero here? I'm hearing mumbling, which is almost certainly the right answer. Let's just stop that because that's uh, like, if you look at this, uh, the stack trace here is, it's basically, it's so skip, I don't know, you can't, probably can't read this, but here at the top it says, it says skip 25 duplicate frames because this is uh, like going to take a long time to compute uh, Fibonacci of 120 uh, with this algorithm, right? And so we all know how to fix this, right? You, um, the standard way that you can compute the, the nth Fibonacci numbers with only n uses of addition instead of like some exponential numbers of additions, which is what this algorithm is, is you accumulate it with the previous value, right? Okay, but that's not gonna satisfy the programming language, programming language, er, guy, <laughs> right? What's a, is there a better way that we could do this? If we had another programming language, maybe? So this is, uh, so we can say, the Fibonacci numbers are a sequence of numbers that begin with zero and then have one, and Connell's back there and knows what's coming. Then are followed, like, and so any of you programmed with streams before? So, okay, I'll give you the two second version of what this code is doing if you haven't, but this is the, this is an infinite stream of Fibonacci numbers, and what's, what it says is the first Fibonacci number is zero, 
the second Fibonacci number is one, and then um, uh, map plus, so if you know Haskell, this is like zip width, or this is like map, but where plus is getting two arguments, so you give it two, in this case, infinite streams, but two lists also. So what it's doing is it's, it's like, could or fibs is like, take the Fibonacci numbers, drop the first one. So you can think of that as a stream of all the Fibonacci numbers without the first one. And then fibs is a stream of all the Fibonacci numbers. And so what it's doing is it's just doing pairwise addition all the way along them and making a new stream out of that. And that is all the fibs. So we can say uh, 10 fibs, and we get the first 10, and we can say take 100 fibs, and uh, laziness does good things here that like make this work. If I take the first 1,009 fibs, it takes longer to print them than to compute them. Um, okay, and uh, so let's package that up for use back in strict land. So how about get fibs of n? And then we want to put n there. And uh, we don't have as good an interoperability story between the lazy programming language and the strict programming language in the way we do between typed and untyped programming languages. And so there's a little bit of like interop glue code there, um, which is that bang bang function, basically. And what the bang bang function means is like get the value now. Um, and then so, and we'll put that right before we would cross things back over to the, uh, to the strict language. Okay. And then, so now we can get rid of this abomination and say, uh, well, here, let's see. So what we want to do is we don't want to do this now. We want to say get fibs of n. And of course, get fibs is a free variable now because I haven't pulled in that library. Um, and this, this lazy language is an untyped lazy language. So we have the same problem we had before um, with connecting between a typed and an untyped programming language. Um, but here there's no like type declaration to guide the interop, so we have to like write it uh, over here. Uh, so you say require typed of uh, lazy, and I want the get fibs function, and it should have this type. Oops, list of it here. Uh, what? Oh. Uh, and I should provide it over here. And now, um, what this is saying is, um, assume, dear type checker, please assume that this is the correct type and um, prove that you obey it and then turn green when you've done that. And um, insert the similar kind of dynamic checking via the contract system to make sure that the untyped side is obeying what you've declared here. So in this case, we know that get fibs is gonna be called with an integer, and we have to check that it returns a list of integers. Um, but here, let's just put this back in the essay now. So now, now I can hit this button, and I should get things, and hey, and there's our, there's our beautiful math spirals. Okay, okay so that's, that's a taste of programming in the programming language, programming language. And what I wanna do for the rest of this talk is try to give you um, a, a little bit of a glimpse into the technology that, that makes it work. Okay. So here is a picture of um, an architectural diagram of a compiler, of an implementation of a language. All right, and really I just wanna focus in on the compiler. And so let's look inside that box a little bit. If you um, open up a compiler, you expect to find a, like a giant, a function with a giant case statement in it, like this one. Um, so the compiler takes in an expression and then does some kind of pattern matching on the expression. And if it's a conditional, it does this thing. And if it's an addition, it does that thing and blah, 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 blah. And if you were to look at the implementation of Scribble or of the typed language or the regular racket language or the lazy language or like any of the other programming languages we have, you, you, these boxes would all look very similar to each other. I mean, there's important differences between a lazy programming language and a strict programming language. But in terms of the like delta number of characters and the implementation of the compiler is small. And the same thing for the type checker, right? In fact, many type checkers, uh, many typed programming languages for a long time, their implementation strategy was basically do the type checking and then compile it using the untyped compiler for, the, for a sort of a similar programming language. All right, and typed rackets is a little bit smarter than that, but there's really not a lot of difference if you're looking at this level of granularity. And so kind of the magic that we want to to make work, to be able to reuse a lot of code, to be able to implement all these languages 
um, the way we have is to, we want to think about our compiler um, and the reuse in our compiler at, at this level, sort of boxes of this, and we want to mix and match boxes that sort of correspond to cases in our compiler. Okay. And the way we do that <laughs> is, is macros. Okay. Um, so let me explain. Let me try to explain that. So first I'll just define what a macro is. A macro extends a language by adding one feature to that programming language and specifying how that one new feature compiles into some existing features. And so if you're thinking about mixing and matching boxes in your compiler's implementation, um, you need a little bit more to be able to like pick a subset of boxes and put them together into a programming language. Um, and that's something that the module system handles for you and that I won't really be talking much more about in this talk. So we'll just focus on this one piece of how you can take a programming language and add one feature to the programming language via a macro. Okay. And I have to do a little bit of history here and take you back to roughly 1963 um, uh, as, as immortalized in GCC-traditional CPP. And if you were to run this program in GCC-traditional CPP, anybody know what it prints? Salad bar, which is terrible, okay, okay. <laughs> So if you look at this program and you're, you're like a normal person, you see an open quote on the first line and you see a closed quote on some further line down there and you think that's a string. Um, and if you are in the 1963 technology of uh, macros, um, that's not what you see. What you do is a textual replacement of foo with open quote salad and that's all you do. Um, okay, so now, um, there's a lot of baggage associated with macro, so that's why I'm taking you through this sort of quick tour of history of, uh, so we all caught up with what's a good macro system. And um, I want to point out why this is a bad macro system, okay? Um, this is a bad macro system because it doesn't respect the parsing level structure of the programming language, right? The lexeme structure. There's a thing such as a string in the programming language, and we should respect that in the macro system by not sort of munging in the middle of strings. Okay, that's a bad macro system because it doesn't respect the parsing level structure of the programming language. Okay, now we're caught up with the current GCC. Um, and this is also very old in terms of the macro technology and what we understand um, about macros. But anybody know what this produces? 10 is close and 25 is wrong, okay, 25 is what you would hope it to produce, and it, it actually produces 11, right? Okay, why does it produce 11? All right, I, I'm, you, okay, is that um, this does not expand into that, which is what a sane person might expect it to expand into. Instead, what, what happens when you do the substitution with this macro for three plus two is you get that, and if you please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, it's the same as that, uh, which is 11. This is also, a bad macro system, okay? This is a bad macro system because it doesn't respect the expression level structure of the programming language that it plays a host to. So when you're um, a macro writer and you write a macro like that one, you're expecting that each of those occurrences of X is gonna have the, like a tree plugged in, not a sequence of tokens plugged into it, right? So you expect that, you, you think of the expression three plus two as a tree with three as the node and uh, with, uh, with plus as a node and three and two as the children of it, and then in the macro substitution template thing that happens at compile time, you expect that entire tree to be plugged in for X, right? Not just a sequence of, of lexemes basically being plugged in for X. Okay, so this is a bad macro system because it doesn't respect the expression structure of the programming language. All right. All right, so let me, let me take a minute here and uh, just tell you in a little more detail where we're going with this talk. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to next go through in more detail the definition of a macro, and we'll use racket notation for that. Um, that will, I'll call it a challenge. Well, I'll say, I'll say, let's implement this thing, and we'll see what, what it takes to implement that. And then, and then we'll, go from, we'll get from that into another reason a macro system can be bad, namely that it doesn't respect the scope of the programming language. It doesn't respect the variable level structure of the programming language. And then I'll talk a little bit about how um, when you do respect that, you can get good stuff out, and how we get to really start to get close to this idea that we're taking the compiler and um, sort of getting reused to the level of clauses in the compiler once you have a macro system that's, that's able to respect scope properly. 
And then I'll show you a programming language that I implemented for this talk, um, just to give you a sense of what it takes, you know, and kind of the, um, the pieces that you have to put together in order to actually make a programming language if you were to choose to do that with Racket. All right. Okay, so here's the challenge. Implement OR. Okay, you have a programming language that doesn't have OR in it, and we want to add that to the programming language. And this should be an OR like C's OR, or like the Lisp OR, where um, you evaluate the first expression. If it returns something that's not false, that's the value of the entire OR expression. If it returns false, and only if it returns false, then you evaluate the other expression, and then that should be the value. So it's both short-circuiting, and also, it, there's not just two Booleans, right? Everything that's not false is, counts as true, and so you should return it, okay? Um, and this is the example function that we'll use to test out a bunch of bad versions of the OR macro. Okay, so this is a function that, given a list, returns true if the list is either empty or contains exactly one element in it. All right, so here is non-solution one. It's not even a macro. If we define OR as a function, and we um, uh, call the zero one list predicate with the empty list, then we'll get could or given the empty list because in a call by value programming language, you evaluate the arguments to a function before you do the substitution into the body. That's what, that's what functions mean. And so what happens here is we evaluate null question mark of x, that's true, but then we keep evaluating because or is a function, and so it crashes. Okay, so, so this is not, so when you have a function, you can't get the short circuiting behavior, so we can't use a function to implement or, right? When you're working with macros, if you can use a function, you do, do it, okay? So here we can't, so we need to use a, a macro. This is, all right, so that's a macro up there. Let me uh, zoom in a little bit on that and just read to you the syntax so you can understand uh, you know, what's, what's really going on with the, just sort of get over some of the notational hurdles here with this. So the first thing is the keyword, define syntax. What that means is I'm defining something at compile time. It does not mean I'm defining a macro, right? It's more general than just defining a macro. This happens to be the definition of a macro, but define syntax as a construct in the programming language means define something at compile time. Okay, so the thing we're defining is or, and it's being defined to be a function, so I didn't put the put the little nubbin of this thing around the parens, but it's the, both the parens and the word STX there, that means that this is being, the, this is the definition of a function. And so that's what a macro is. A macro is a function that's defined using defined syntax, okay? And we're gonna return to this point later, because you can define other things that aren't functions that give you some power in the macro system. Okay, so, so we're defining or is a function of one argument, and therefore it's a macro. Um, that one, um, that one argument is, it's, this is unlike Clojure's macro system, and that one argument is not kind of the argument to OR. That one argument is the entire expression that was at, that was used by OR. Okay, so um, then now we're in the body of the function, and what happens in the body of the function is we use um, this pattern matching library called syntax parse. So I am going to pattern match on the tree that was the expression, and I'm gonna be doing that pattern matching because I'm in the body of this function at compile time. This is um, the line that begins with the square bracket there. They're just following the rest of it, not including the square bracket, is the pattern that I expect uh, to appear at that point. So this is, should be an or expression, so it should begin with the keyword or, and then it's got two sub-expressions, um, x, x expression and y expression. And then this thing is the result of the macro. So I'm gonna transform my or expression into an if expression. And you see that um, hash tick at the beginning of the line, hash quote, that means I'm constructing a new expression. If I left off the hash tick, that would mean I'm doing a conditional at compile time. Right? But because I have the hash tick on the front, that means that's the result of this macro transformer. I'm replacing the or expression with the if expression, because that's what the macro returns. And this is all happening at compile time. Okay, so that's our, um, that's our macro. And this is not a good solution to the problem, because it duplicates code. So if we look at what happens when we actually apply the macro transformation to the zero and list function, then we get this. So the, the x expression gets duplicated into the test position and the then position of our if expression. And so we have two null question mark x's when we had one originally. So that's bad because what if we had nested ors? Here I have one null question mark x expression and then uh, I do one step of macro transformation. Now I have two of them and two more ors and I 
now I have four of them. And you see, if I nest it one more time, you can imagine what's going to happen. Um, and so this, you know, the, the size of the expansion when you duplicate code can in general grow, grow exponentially in the size of the program, and your compiler is going to choke on that. So that's bad. This is bad. Uh, it's actually worse than that, though, because of um, state. And, uh, test and set is like this low-level primitive you can use to implement synchronization, like locks and semaphores and things like that. Um, and what it, what it does is it checks to see if x is set, and if x is set, it returns false, and if x is not set, so like x is some location in memory, if x is not set, then it sets it and returns true. And so if you duplicate that expression, then it's always gonna be true, and you sort of, your little proto-lock implementation is not gonna be doing what you want it to do. Right, so, okay, so duplication of code is just bad. All right. Okay, so we know how to avoid duplicating code. We use local variables, right? You just bind the result of the x expression to some variable x, and then you can refer to the variable twice. And now we're in good shape because, uh, well, at least we, we don't have the, we're not duplicating the effect. We're not gonna cause the compiler to choke because we're not sort of growing ridiculous amounts of code in the expansion. But th so let's look and see how this transforms. So if I have my zero one list function, which unfortunately also happened to use the variable name x in it, <clears throat> then I've got sort of two x's and they're gonna collide with each other. So if I call the zero one list function on a list with one element in it, it's supposed to return true and instead it crashes with cutter given false. The only use of cutter is that, that one in the bottom right there, see so cutter of x there. That x is, in the original program, the x is referring to the parameter, it's the argument to the zero on list function, but in, after the macro expansion step, it's referring to this temporary variable that got introduced, so that's bad, okay. And that's not what we wanted. Now, the problem in this case is not with the macro. The problem is that the macro system is not respecting a part of the host programming language. It's not respecting the scope, the notion of scope, the variables in the, in the host programming language. So what we want is something called hygiene, okay? And so now, I just, just to put this in some context, we are now caught up with 1986, okay? In macro technology, all right? After I explain how, in the next two slides or three slides or whatever, all right? Okay. <laughs> um, so the way hygiene works is you say, Oh, this is the original program. I will put a marker on all the variables in it to indicate that they are in the zeroth step of macro expansion. They exist before macro expansion started happening. And then whenever I do a step of macro transformation, any variables that are introduced in that step, they will get a number associated with whatever step they are on or a color associated with it. So the x's that are the parameter to the zero and list function have zero, and the x's that were introduced by the macro expansions, the first macro expansion step have a one, and the compiler knows the zeros and ones, those sort of count morally as different x's. Okay. So this program now, uh, you know, this macro is correct if you use a good macro system, one that respects the scope. So it's important, recap, we wanna respect the parsing level structure of the programming language in the macro system. We wanna respect the expression level structure of the programming language in our macro system, and we want to respect the variable level structure of the programming language. You need to be able to do all these things so you have this firm foundation on which to be able to build real programming languages. You don't want to have to like remember to put hashes on the ends of your identifiers. Right? It's easy to make mistakes if you do that. And in fact, there's, there's more to be said there. Putting hashes is not actually that big a deal. But in some situations, you, don't, you, you both need to put and not put the hash, right? Okay, so those so of you know what I'm talking about, you know, okay. But um, so I want to, to, I want to go a little further now and to talk about how when you have scope sort of really understood by the programming language, by the macro system, that you can build some good stuff um, using it. And I, I'm gonna do that by looking at um, kind of a, a common flaw, a common, I don't know what, I don't know what bad thing that, that happens in programming languages, um, you know, like in the, in the general uh, Lisp scheme family, where you don't have an enum operation, you don't have enums. So what you do is you use symbols instead of, um, and if you're not familiar with that sort of thing, then, then strings, it's the same thing as using strings here. So basically I have, I have in my mind 
the notion that there are four kinds of animals I'm interested in with this program, and I'm using symbols or strings or whatever to, to represent those four different, because I don't have a notion of en an enum thing built into my programming language. So in this case, there's dogs, turtles, sheep, and horses, and that's how I think about what the possible, character, uh, possible animals are. And if I forget one of them, then the programming language doesn't complain at me. And if I don't have a good enough test suite, I don't notice. Or it's actually kind of worse than that because, of course, you're never gonna leave it alone, right? Your programs either, the programs either evolve and change or they're dead. And so probably I'm going to change and add a new thing to my enum or remove one or something like that. And I wanna be able to help the compiler to actually help me find the places where I need to modify my program. All right. So, um, so we'll return to this define syntax guy now. And now I'm using define syntax to bind at compile time the variable animals to a set. And it's a set of all the symbols that currently I think of as what the animal enum should be. And what's interesting about this definition is that I'm not defining a macro. I'm just defining a thing, which will be useful to me at compile time. A macro is a function that's useful to me at compile time that the macro expander knows how to work with. Here I'm just defining a variable that's useful to me at compile time. And so I can look it up at compile time. And so you need one more piece to be able to do that. If you say syntax local value, um, you give it an expression that should, and that expression should be a variable, then it will look up what that variable is bound to. And you can use this at compile time to look up what animals is bound to. So if you do this, then you'll get back that set, that same set. Okay. And now we can put this together with the ability to define macros to actually put some checking in. So, so here is the definition of an animal case macro. Okay. And it's still using syntax parse, and it's actually not doing anything interesting with animals yet. It's just expanding directly into the case expression. So what this is saying is an, an animal, animal case expression should have an animal expression and then followed by a bunch of cases. The ellipsis means you can repeat the thing that comes before as many times as you like. So we can have as many different cases and each case can have as many animals as you want inside them. And it just expands into the case. So it's using the same construct we were using before to do the case dispatch. And what we really wanna do is layer in some additional checking that tells us um, whether or not we've got the right set of animals in there. Okay, so um, we can just run stuff at compile time because this macro is, is run at compile time. And so what we can do is I've, I've written a little function called same as set, which I'm not showing you here, but basically I give it as one argument the, the tree that corresponds to all of the animals that are mentioned in this expression. And I give it the other argument syntax local value hash quote animals, which as we know is gonna just look up what animals is in the current lexical context and return to that set that we had there. And then same as set will return either true or false if they're the same when viewed as a set. Okay. And then what we can do is we can just check and see if that Boolean is true or not. And if it's false, then we'll call this function called raise syntax error. And what raise syntax error takes is the first two arguments are basically some information about you know, text to put into the error message. And the interesting one is that third argument. And what that um, raise syntax error does is it looks at that and there's like metadata associated with the tree um, that got passed into the animal case macro that has things like line and column information in it. And it can use that to give an error message directly, you know, highlighting the right spot in the, in the source text or just to print out line and column information if you're running at the terminal or whatever. Okay. So um, we don't, maybe we want to have more enums than just animals. So maybe we should have define enum which uses a nice syntax for enums and gives us a, um, a single point of control so that we can have maybe have better error messages and more refined checking in, our, in, our, in an enum case macro. Um, so we say define enum animals, and of course that should just expand into define syntax, right? And so that's like, okay, so you guys are all up to speed on how macros work, and so that, that's, a, that's a straightforward macro now. You just turn it into define syntax. Um, and then uh, we can generalize, this is the exact same code as animal case, except for the word animal is now replaced with enum, and there are two other changes, namely you have to you put in the enum um, in addition to putting in the expression, and then use syntax local value on that enum. And so because scope is baked into the understanding that the macro system has of the programming language, then this syntax local value is going to get the right enum 
So you can declare your enum in a local scope somewhere and it will work. It will do the, the, the right thing because syntax local value understands the scope of the programming language in the same way that the macro system understands the scope. Okay, so this is more general than just, just um, the sort of original notion of hygiene. Um, but, it, but if you're thinking about it as a macro programmer or as a user of these macros, you just think scope, scope works. And that's enough to understand what's happening in this macro. Okay. All right, and so here's what the code looks like. And I left out the turtle case again, and now we get this enum case and um, with the right source location and everything it would be printed out in the, in the error if we run it in, the, in, in Dr. Racket or in the terminal or whatever. All right, okay, so that's, that's a little bit about some of the benefits you get of uh, having a macro system that properly respects the underlying structure of the programming language that it's a host to. Um, and gets us caught up to maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure where, somewhere in, somewhere in the late 90s, early 2000s of, of macro system technology. In 2002, I think. Okay, not that there's been a lot since then, but there's some, okay. All right, so let me take a minute now and show you another programming language that I um, implemented for this talk that um, is a mini hardware description language, okay? Um, and I'll just show you this program and then I'll give you kind of a flyby of uh, the implementation of the programming language so you can get a sense of how much code it takes to do something. Okay, so uh, mini HTL is, it, it's really focused on like the, um, uh, the combinatory logic. You know, there's no, there's no cycles or anything like that happening here. But um, so if I, if, I, uh, if, if I say you say inputs and you put a bunch of variables this is the inputs to the circuit, and then this equals 11 means take 11, think of it as a two's complement um, binary number, and then initialize a0, a1, a2, et cetera, um, as the booleans corresponding to those ones and zeros, and do the same thing with the 22 in, in the b's, and then do some stuff, and then show int, you give it, you give it the, the ones and zeros, the booleans, that corresponds to, you know, to whatever, and it's gonna assemble them into a two's complement integer and print it out. And so, uh, anybody know what this is gonna print when I run it? Did you read it yet? Anybody recognize this? Anybody take like intro to CE as an undergrad or anything like that? If this, is a, this is a ripple carry adder, okay, so it's gonna, it's gonna sum the numbers. Yeah, okay. 11 plus 22 is 33, good. Okay, um, and if I, uh, um, I made a variation on this language called the gate count variation. And if I run that one, then let's see. Uh, then um, it shows you how the values are kind of flowing through the circuit. So you can see um, how roughly how many time steps it takes, where a time step corresponds to um, a gate switching, okay, with, which in a matter is a, is, a, is a good measure for time. Um, so initially, you know, all the, uh, all the variables are not known, and then in the first step, all the inputs become known, and then some of these intermediate things are not known, but they come, become known in various, at various points throughout. And the reason that they sort of become known at different steps is they depend on other things um, earlier. So they become known sort of as values flow through the circuit. And so it took, uh, what, six time steps to compute the sum of to compute that sum, and if I change it to doing this, then it takes only three time steps, and that's because and and or have certain short-circuiting behavior that makes additions of different numbers go faster than other numbers, okay? And, and so since I was kind of playing around with this stuff, I um, also put a loop in the programming language implementation that if you don't initialize the values in the gate code language, it just runs them all and gives you a summary of it, so you can get kind of a sense of, there's like a lot of difference, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on inside your chips, like, it doesn't actually use ripple carry adders in your implementation in your, in your laptops there. Um, and there's like some interesting stuff that happens if you, I don't know, anyway, I find that stuff cool. But, so let me show you the implementation of this programming language. So here is a sample program, sort of a shorter version, a ripple carry adder with two bits. And the first thing that happens is, of course, we make it more beautiful. <laughs> um, this is the parser. Okay, and it's, a, it's 109 lines of code, and it's uh, in a very small font over there, and um, it's basically using, you know, Lex and Yak library that Racket comes with. 
right? And then once we have it in that form, then um, the macros come in, and this is, what this is what the macro transformation for that program does. So inputs, that inputs declaration just turns into a bunch of definitions, one for each variable. Equals really was just define. Um, and nth bit is a uh, function in the runtime system for this little programming language. So this is, this 73 lines of code over here is the implementation of those, of the, the XOR and the wedge and whatever, those Boolean operations, as well as the trans, those macros that did the transformation. And you can kind of imagine that those macros are not super complicated, right? It's just calling nth bit, you know, with zero, with, with you know, n, and then, the, and then the number it was initialized with. Um, so the macros are not very complicated. They're pretty simple transformations, and that's why the code's short. Um, and then um, it expands in a totally different way for the gate count language, because I want to be able to count how many times, you know, I want to be able to like interrupt the process of the values flowing through. So it has a different implementation of the Boolean operations, because they don't just get Booleans now, they also get the I don't know what the value is yet, and they have this nice short circuiting behavior. So if you give, if you give like what, uh, if you give and a false, and in I don't know, it says false, right? Because it doesn't need to know what the other one is. And so, um, so, you, so this iterate function, um, you know, it, it just gets called multiple times to see, and then it keeps going until the, the results don't change in one loop. Of the, and then so there's a little loop, that, that, the, bottom, the bottom thing there where the, the horrible rightward drift, that I don't know if you can see it there, that's the little loop that's calling this generated function multiple times. And this is, this is what the macros expand to for the same program in the gate count programming language. So this expansion's you know, slightly different, but really it's still a very simple expansion. And that's why it's only in 107 lines. So, uh, and then there's another, then these lines right here, this is a little metadata programming language that basically stitches together the parser and says like, my parser's over there and my, my other files are over there and here's, how you, here's the exported name of the parser and whatever. And so you put all that together, it's like about 300 lines of code. Um, for, for that implementation of mini HDL. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, this is a picture of the directory structure of the standard distribution of Racket. And that little um, not looking thing in the middle is the root of the tree, and the circles are the files. And so what I'm going to do now is color in the circles based on the programming language that they're, that they're written in. Um, and this is, you know, like a lot of the reason why we're able to make Racket have the batteries that it has, and it's got some, it's got a lot of batteries included in it, is because we're able to leverage the macro system and the fact that we can write things in whatever programming language we find most convenient. Um, and there's definitely a power law thing happening here. This everything else black thing on the bottom contains a bunch of crazy little one-off programming languages in it. Okay, and. Um, this slide always makes me think of Paul Hudak, someone whose birthday was yesterday, as you may recall. And this is a quote that, that he made. He did a lot of work on domain-specific languages in the context of Haskell. All right, so let me just leave you with two thoughts. Um, macros are a lot of what makes us able to, as a not very large team, build Racket. Um, and uh, there's a lot going on there in the macro system that's both interesting, like if you want to do some hacking and you want to build a programming language, and interesting if you're a researcher studying how to build programming languages. And uh, if you need a new programming language, you know, and everybody does, maybe you should give, <laughs> maybe you should give Racket a try. All right, thanks. Um, Racket's thread construct is green threads style, so it has, um, um, it doesn't do it the, the way, it doesn't have the, the gill, the way Python or whatever do. Um, but, uh, so, so the threading construct is for concurrency, um, so for like programming GUIs and with, with uh, you know, networking and stuff like that where you're interested in bringing non-determinism into the programming language. And um, then there's two separate constructs for parallelism. Um, one is futures and one is called places, and they have different trade-offs 
um, having to do with the fact that our runtime system is about 15 years old and heavily optimized for the sequential case. Um, and one, one of them, um, yeah, I, I can tell you more about them later, but, but roughly um, we have support for parallelism in this two different ways, and one of them clones the runtime system state, and one of them kind of knows which part of the runtime system state is safe to run in parallel, and they have different limitations and different trade-offs depending on you know, what your actual parallel application looks like. Um, so like, and the, the, the build system for Racket is all parallel using places, the cloning the runtime system state. No. Oh, sorry, the question was if there's anything, maybe we should finish, I should I cut you off. Yeah. Uh, whether the, the question is whether there's anything with a similar power that you can use in a browser. Uh, I feel like that's a very dangerous question for me to answer. <laughs> there's JavaScript in browsers, and it has a level of power. Um, which I would say is different than Racket. Uh, maybe I should leave it at that. I don't know. So uh, there's a there's a project that um, to run Racket that's a job, uh, Racket to JavaScript compiler called Whale Song, which lets you run some much of Racket in a browser. Um, Yeah, so there's a, there's an, a CFFI. Uh, the question is whether or not um, Racket has in, a good interoperability story for languages that are not written using Racket, <laughs> right? And definitely the interoperability story is worse than it is f uh, for languages that are, you know, the lang languages can cooperate at a higher level when, they, when they're implemented together with macros because uh, I didn't talk about the module system, but they can, they can interact at higher levels than just um, the kind of low level denom lowest common denominator that you expect from uh, more traditional interop stories. Um, but we also have a, we have a C FFI interface that's um, got some interesting clever, Ellie Bar Barzelay uh, did it, it's got some interesting cleverness in there having to do with not needing a C compiler all the time. Um, that makes, but it, it's a C FFI that, that's maybe what you're used to. Uh, how does, so the question is how the contract generation works with um, user-defined types between typed racket and, and untyped racket, and it works fine. The, the, the typed racket type system knows how to generate uh, contracts for every type that you could define yourself using typed racket. Is the type system itself extensible? Um, uh, not, it's not as extensible as someone who's steeped in the macro world of Racket might wish it were, right? In the sense that like, like for example, the pattern matcher in, in Racket lets you define new kinds of patterns that you can add in, and um, you might hope that a type system in the spirit of Racket would let you give new type rules, say, to define new things, which it doesn't currently do. Although I think it could and should, and the guy who implemented the thing that does the pattern matcher, the extensibility in the pattern matcher, also implemented typed racket, and um, I think he should really get on that. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the macros at the type level I, and in a way of, of defining an extensible type system seem like something that would be really cool to have, but we don't have it right now. It's extensible in the more traditional ways of like user-defined types um, that you expect from a normal type system. Yeah. 
um, the, the question is, um, uh, and I will paraphrase this a lot, <laughs> uh, you've let somebody add things to the compiler and now they can break all of your programs. <laughs> they can break all the things. And the answer is yes. <laughs> um, if, you know, we've, I mean, in some sense, I, I don't know if I, we, we sort of made the program worse, problem worse, because it used to be that you know only the the trusted few had the power to extend the compiler, and now we're saying let's all extend the compiler, right? And so um, you know that in some sense makes the program worse, but I think worse in a that's a different variation on worse is better, maybe worse in a better way. Um, <laughs> uh, so so yeah, I, I think all those problems are there, and that's an interesting thing to study, and now we have a platform to study it how we can do better, yeah, and so, I don't know, maybe not the satis most satisfying answer, but. Where is, uh, the question is where is this image from? Uh, you mean the, 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 the background, not, yeah, uh, that's from the lunchroom? <laughs> the the graph? Oh, ah, I use a racket program. <laughs> and Nito, Nito, the which comes with graph is, you know, dot you may have heard of to, to actually lay out the actual graph, but a racket program to sort of get the data. Thank you.